Shane Becker. I, you might recognize me by my avatar more than my real life face. I go by Vegan Straight Edge. Um, I have a website. I am Shane.com. I have a couple announcements. He uh, sort of stole a little thunder there. Um, ben Blyden and I, together we are a shaving. Um, we organize a conference in Seattle called uh, Cascadia Ruby. Uh, it serves the sort of Portland, Seattle, Vancouver area. Uh, we did one last year in July. We're doing another one. Uh, it's super great. You should come up. Um, it's August 3rd and 4th. We're signing the contract this week, so it's still possible, I guess, that both that date will change, but that's roughly it. Um, uh, I'm doing another farmhouse comp in May, so on 5-5-012. Um, like Kobe said, it's in my backyard. It's under a 100-year-old avocado tree. Um, it's at my house, which is Old farmhouse. It's really good. You should go. Oh, okay. uh, uh, singing the endorsement there. I just realized I still have going on. Now, so I apologize for that. It's very happy. Um, and uh, it's just, it's sort of like backyard TED Talks. There's storytelling, there's no slides, there's no projectors, there's no worry of anyone staring at the wall the whole time while they talk to you. Um, and uh, like any provocative talk, um, it, is, it is more not some things than it is others. So I just want to clear up a couple of misconceptions here. Hey, um, the guy with the plaid shirt and the striped hoodie that just walked in, can you close that door for me? Thanks. Um, so uh, I am not a unique and beautiful snowflake. I am not that different than all of you in this room. I think what I'm saying doesn't just apply to me and people like me. I'm not married, I don't have kids, and I don't have a mortgage. And maybe you have some combination of those, but I think what I'm saying now applies to Joe O'Brien, who spoke first and has all those things as much as it does anyone else. I love Octo, it's great. Um, this talk is not an attack on capitalism, that's a talk for a different day. And this talk is also <laughs> not an attack on uh, work with a capital W, meaning not just the act of laboring to accomplish some goal, not lowercase w work. But the idea of going to a job to survive. This talk, again, is not an attack on that. That's a different thing. OK, so real talk. If you were guaranteed not to fail, what would you do? That's the, the thing that underlines everything in my life. So put it in a different way. If you were to die right now, what would you regret having not done? So the obvious second question, or the follow-up to that question is always, what's stopping you? Why aren't you doing those things? You know, what's really stopping you? And this travel the world, getting a passport is not something that stops you from traveling the world. That's just a thing that you get to do. Right? And I don't know you. I don't know what kind of code you write, or what project you're on, or what your day-to-day -day bullshit is like at work. I don't know how much money you make. I don't know your hopes and dreams and secret desires. You always have to have a secret plan. Always have a secret plan. But I do know this. You're better than you think you are, right? Um, all right. Um, you know, in this room and in this community, I see some of the smartest, most creative people in the world. I see all this beautiful, amazing potential, and I see it squandered every day, just squandered. You know, it's just an entire generation of incredible programmers building online advertising and the next walled garden data silo social network for bullshit that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as you might have guessed from the title of my talk, I want you to quit your job. And uh, this isn't a metaphor. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Uh, actually, as a quick survey, who uh, is here whose boss is also here? 
Okay. <laughs> sort of an awkward pickle. I you <laughs> so there, there's a multitude of reasons that I want you to quit. All right. So who here is the smartest person on their team? Like, be honest. Okay. Most of you aren't being honest. Um, don't be so humble. Right. So it's okay to admit that you're smarter than most people. Like, like um, Joe was saying, you know, you were bored in science class or math class because you were smarter than the teacher. You're probably not learning as much as you should be or could be if you were on a better team. I've had the great fortune of working with uh, Aaron Patterson twice. Man, if you want to learn a whole lot real fast, work with that guy. And I share my living room office with Evan and John, who just spoke every day. You, know, you think you're nerdy. Right? <laughs> um, try being the least smart person on a team, or try being somewhere in the middle. You know, you'll learn a whole lot real fast. Um, I guarantee you're not making enough money. Uh, so we all do Ruby. Who also does iOS stuff? So, you know, okay. Who also does Android? Okay. So you people can write your own ticket, work wherever you want, and get paid as much as you want. Okay. Um, it's 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 ridiculous. What it was kind of what Joe was talking about. You know, like the people's motivations for. Why they want to work at a place and what you know excites them to excel. Um, at a certain point, money doesn't do it anymore. But if we're in a boom right now, Jesus Christ, take advantage of that. Make a whole lot of money doing something awesome and bank a lot. Um, so uh, I want you to think about your salary, whatever that number is. Hold that in your head right now, and give yourself a raise right now. Right? So in your head. Uh, <laughs> so what is that that new salary? How much? This guy's real excited. <laughs> I'm just watching my boss. boss. Okay, so, so this guy just gave himself an awesome raise. Um, whatever that number is, your new salary, increase it again by 25 or 50 percent. Sincerely, you know, I promise you, you are worth more than you think you are. So, um, who here is hiring? We always hear that at conferences and meetups. Okay, keep your hands up for a second. Um, everyone who's hiring, keep your hand up if you're willing to pay big salaries to poach good people from other places. Okay, everyone, everyone who thinks they're not getting paid enough, group A. Everyone whose hands are up, group B. Group A, meet group B. <laughs> so, after we're done here, uh, you can put your hand down. <laughs> uh, maybe in the break, you groups can talk to each other. So, the, but that's just step one. That's just you know a better job. It's just making more money. So maybe you quit your job to go do something fun. You know, like um, a social network for cats or video games. iPad video games for cats. Uh, or, or maybe just to do something different. You've been at the same place for 13 months, and that's past your one year limit. Uh, or maybe to go do nothing at all, right? Like, the work ethic in this culture is killing us. Why would we toil away making shit that no one needs? There's nothing wrong with doing nothing. Maybe you go start your own company, right? Like, like Ron Evans and Dan Fisher, they, they run a consultancy and they love it, right? Like, they are their own bosses. Uh, maybe you go start a product shop because you want to build the iPad games for cats. Um, or um, you know, maybe you start a collective with your friends and peers, right? You, you take co-working to like the logical end. If you spend enough time in the same space with someone, surely you come up with ideas for something left to do that you don't need a job, you don't need someone else telling you what to do, you got it. Right? Or maybe you just never quit a job before you're terrified. At what lies just off the edge of that cliff. Maybe you do it to gain courage. And I've quit several jobs. And I've you know, I've i fired several jobs and I've had a few quit me. And <laughs> that, that moment, that's the best moment ever. You know, it's like I mean, you know when you start a new project at a job for yourself and, and you say, you know, like blue skies and green fields. Well it's really like clear eyes and full hearts, right? Nothing is better than that moment, freshly out of the job, before you even start thinking about what's next. And if you're in this room, like you've got it worked out, like there's what's next is easy. But that moment where you're you're free for a few minutes, that's the best. Or maybe you're not proud of the work you do. 
Maybe you're not proud of the product that you build. Maybe you're not proud of the company you work for. Those are the best reasons ever to quit. Maybe you quit your job and professional program. I don't know. Paint a self-portrait, build a house. You know, travel the world. Throw down some cardboard and do some old school break dancing. <laughs> Just you know, get wild. Maybe you quit because every day that you go to your job, you're quietly dying a little bit on the inside. And one day you wake up and you're in the middle of an iteration planning meeting that's cross-functional where you assign story points to the next bullshit feature. <laughs> and you realize, I've spent too much of my life on this. <laughs> or maybe you quit because you realize you have the skills of one of the most important crafts of our culture. Right? Think about that for a second. Software touches everything. It's not just in our lives, right? Because we're nerds, and obviously, like, we make the software that we're touching all the time. But the muggles walking out outside who have no idea what's going on in this room. <laughs> you know, like, even in their lives, right? Computers and phones, obviously, and websites. But our banks, our grocery stores, and this hotel, everything about our lives is mitigated through software. Our entire culture is arranging itself around software. You know, I'm, I'm not the only person to think that software is the new literacy. I think Matt Mullenweg said that first, but the idea that everyone should know some degree of scripting or coding or whatever you want to call it. They should all be able to build things because that's the new mass profession. After farming and manufacturing and construction and service work, programming is the next mass profession. So we hold these skills of this craft that's so important and we build the bullshit that we build. So maybe you quit because you hold in your hands and in your brains this, this, the skills of this craft, and you want to do something that is more meaningful. Right? You want to uh, build something that outlives you, that makes the world a better place, um, that makes lives better, and maybe, maybe you can transform culture with that. Um, so this is the tallest slide I have. I'm sorry, people in the back. It's like one of my rules. Um, so I'll read it to you. I'm going to give. Uh, I want to do like a brief computer science history lesson here, and this is a brief, very complete uh, history of noteworthy achievements in the field of computing as researched almost exclusively on Wikipedia. So some dates like C was invented in '72 really means like they've been working on it for a few years. But Okay, so in 1820s and 30s, Babbage sets out to build the first mechanical calculator, and then later the uh, difference in it. And his, uh, his friend Ada Lovelace gets into it and writes the first algorithm, Note G, um, which was designed to be executed on a machine. And that machine was never finished um, getting built by Babbage. He ran out of money and money and political sort of squabbling. Years later, um, a science museum built the, the difference engine and the analytical engine, analytical engine. And Ada's algorithm worked. So not only did she write the first algorithm, she wrote it for a machine that she couldn't test on. Right? <laughs> um, she was arguably the first programmer. Right? Um, Alonzo Church invented lambda calculus in 1935. And Grace Hopper invented COBOL and the first compiler. In the 40s, wrote a compiler, right? Um, I mean, write a compiler at all. Write a compiler using like C++, and it's still non-trivial. Right? Um, and then we get Lisp in, Lisp in 1958. <laughs> uh, and then some of these are going to slip down on the bottom of the screen, and it doesn't really matter because I'll say them out loud, and this will be online later. Um, so uh, Engelbart, Douglas Engelbart invents the mouse, and it's this wooden block, and it has wheels. And what do you do when you have a mouse and uh, computers as they were in the 60s, right? You can collect coordinates. What the hell is a mouse for, right? There was no GUI, right? So uh, he goes on to explore the ideas of hypertext and hypermedia, which were first, those words were first said by Ted Nelson, who's also independently working on those ideas, and Project Xanadu, which never really shifts, and, like the ultimate vaporware. Um, in the 1968, Douglas Engelbart gets in front of a room full of people 
uh, and gives the mother of all demos and shows off. If you were to show off any one of these things in 1968, I think that would be pretty, you know, groundbreaking. But he had a mouse and video conferencing and teleconferencing and a GUI and hypermedia and word processing and um, you know a bunch of other things that are on this list. You know, he had video conferencing, real time, you know, text editing between machines in 1968, all before he okay, and So the ARPANET, which is just one of the pieces that would eventually become the internet, there was um, Cyclades in France and one in England, and there was also the RAM Corporation network. They started using packet switching and TCP. Right? And then uh, we get Unix and those two guys. <laughs> They knew a thing or two about a thing or two, right? <laughs> uh, and then uh, at Xerox Park, um, Adele and Goldberg and some others invent Smalltalk and object-oriented programming, and then they proceed to invent or reinvent everything. <laughs> Basically, modern computers, that's when we know them. Um, and then before now, before 1972, you could send email, but only on the same host. It was like a Facebook message. And then, so this guy on the side, <laughs> with his boss not knowing about it, uh, works it out so that on the ARPANET you could send Shane, uh, email to veganshridge at gmail.com and it would come to me even if you weren't on Gmail. Novel, right? <laughs> and then Ken Thompson and Vince Ritchie strike back and invent C <laughs> for mostly 1972. And then Waz uh, comes up with the Apple One. Amazing little uh, board, right? And then we get Emacs from Stallman and he's later something, some joke about his feeds. <laughs> and then in 1977, we get the Apple II from Jobs and Watts. And, we um, and then Bill Joy, uh, sort of, you know, clean room, uh, reverse engineers, Unix and ships, DSD, and then later, how many of you use Vim? You're welcome, all right? Uh, <laughs> uh, not for me, from Bill Joy. Uh, and then we get, uh, who's old enough to remember VBSs, all right? So, Ward Christensen. I think the origin story for this is he was snowed in in a blizzard in Chicago uh, one winter and sat down for like two weeks or whatever and cranked this out and changed the world of numbers. So you could download uh, software or whatever. Um, and then uh, who else also used Usenet before web, right? So we got back to 79. <coughs> Usenet is as, as old as me. Uh, so the Minitel was this sort of computer appliance that the French government ships, which makes the iMac look super not appliancey. If you would go to the place where you bought a blender and a vacuum cleaner to buy this thing, and it was truly all in one, the keyboard too. And it was computery, but it was also very, you know, like you just go to the store and buy it, and it just hooked up to the phone. And you could play chess and check your stocks and get travel directions. And it had like a yellow pages kind of thing, but hidden inside of all that was the first sort of real time chat. Right? Um, oh, and they, it's been up and running for 30 years. They're finally going to decommission it now. Right? I can't think of a website I've made that's lasted more than three years. Right? Well, <laughs> uh, and then we finally get DNS in 1983 by a couple of folks, right? And then 1984 is the Mac. And so this list of stuff is <coughs> is mostly infrastructural achievements, you know, sort of free and open source, even if they weren't called that then. But there's some commercial products in there. But those those commercial products, you know, again, this isn't an attack on capitalism. These things still change the world, right? Whether, regardless of the fact that Apple made a metric fuck ton of money from, from the Mac and the Apple II, they, they change the world. And then we get the GCC from Stallman and another foot joke. Um, <laughs> And the GCC lays the, the foundation for things like Linux later, and squabbling over the name of Linux. Uh, so in 1987, uh, what is Carlo loves the Pearl? Um, so Larry Wall ships Pearl, and writes the first bit of Pearl code, and then ha he has to keep writing more Pearl code because he can't read that original stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, and Pearl 6 is right around the corner. <laughs> um, is anyone on IRC right now? Okay, not, not too many, but we all use, everyone uses IRC in their day-to-day -day nerdings, I guess. Okay. So we get IRC in 1988, and then the ARPANET finally, you know, makes like they're Catholic and pulls out, and then all the other pieces um, finally 
uh, we, we finally get a true internet. Right? It's not owned by the military. It's true. The, the inter is finally true. <coughs> Imagine going to your high school reunion. You're like, oh yeah, you know, I'm a, like a mid-level manager at a regional box company. Um, <laughs> what, what about you, Tim? I, you know, I've got a white kid, I'm pretty happy. What have you been up to? Uh, you know, Hyperdex transport protocol. protocol. I, I made that. Uh, Hyperdex markup language. I made that. I mean, it was, it was based on the the. the I don't know what the S is. <laughs> Serialized. What's the S and S two? Standard generalized markup language. Uh, the web. I, I invented all of the things. Right? <laughs> he did them all at the same time because what is a web browser without a web server, right? And uh, we get Linux in '91, and then Matt shipped uh, Ruby 095, and a good 17 years later, we are one version higher. <laughs> I mean, but using Ruby versioning as like. 30 versions of that. Um, so Ward Cunningham uh, invents the wiki in 95, and a few minutes later we get uh, Wikipedia. <laughs> and think about our lives without Wikipedia, right? Like the, the SOPA blackout was one thing, but like truly think about our lives without Wikipedia. Remember, what's the Microsoft Encarta? <laughs> <laughs> and then this wacky Austri Austrian guy with a funny voice ships uh, Rails, and that that screencast that shows you how you can make a blog in 15 minutes changed my life. I was literally, the night before I was about to start a PhD project, saw that screencast and pulled the plug on everything. And I never looked back. And we're all here because of it, right? Well, except that most of us are here because of the rails. Um, so it's 2012, and I think about in my life, I think about what the hell have I done? And the answer is a resounding not much. I have made a whole lot of websites for other people mostly. Most of them were for just terrible ideas. <laughs> and uh, all but you know, a few I can count on my hands don't exist anymore. And I wasn't smart enough most of the time to even take screenshots, let alone see the code. So twenty twelve, I don't have a job. I was at Engineering until the end of 2011, and this is my year of big projects. I have three big things that aren't really the focus of this talk, so I won't move that into them, but two software and one organizational. And uh, as I'll probably fall off the wagon and, and take a contract job or two, um, because nest egg is only so big. But as much as possible, I'm not working for anyone else. I'm just building these things, and I think these things are important. If we want to talk, if anyone wants to talk about them offline, like we're the not step mode. Um, and I think they have the potential to transform the whole thing, and that's what matters to me more than anything else. I really love baseball. Um, Ken Burns made this baseball documentary called Baseball, and I've watched it several times. And there's this one part where this other guy is quoting this other guy, and Horace Mann said, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. Man, I think about this a lot. A lot, a lot. It keeps me up at night, sincerely. <laughs> so that plus if you're guaranteed not to fail what you do, like, those two things just rock my world when I'm not distracted by you know, Twitter and dogs or whatever. <laughs> So, I'm not trying to tell you what to do, uh, or how to do it, just that you should do something, right? that you're all very smart people, that you're in this room is evidence of that. But yeah, you should do something, whatever that thing is, I'm sure as soon as I started talking about you know, transforming culture and making the world a better place, you started either hatching those old ideas of yours, or you thought of new ones. They're all very bright people, and I don't have all the answers. I have very few answers about very few things. Um, and I don't care about the things that you care about. But you've got something in your brain right now, I'm sure. And uh, I want you to do those things. Stop wasting our effort on things that don't matter. 
And I look around this room, and I see a lot of courage. Right? And that, that gives me strength. Right? You give each other strength. And I don't want you to squander your potential. I am Shane Becker. I know your time is incredibly precious and dear, and you will never get it back. So I appreciate you allowing me to have a few minutes of it.